Can you guys see the presentation? Yeah, I think. Uh, yes, it works well. I can. It see. works well. Okay, then I'll be using also a pointer or laser pointer to direct your um, inform uh, the information towards different point on the slides during my presentation. So, hi everyone. Um, thank you again for. Somebody was saying. Okay. So yeah, thanks also for your kind of um, words and kind of direction. So today I'll be talking about uh, image-based spatial omics technologies, and I just numbered it as one, expecting that we can have more uh, for different focus um, directions in the next um, uh, stages of this uh, virtual uh, workshop, virtual seminar series. And um, simply this field has to do with these aesthetic images that you can see behind this presentation you're looking at stem cells, and on them, there are multiple colors, and each color corresponds to a unique RNA molecule that can be used to quantify gene expression per cell. And in this specific cells, they are mesenchymal stem cells that we are studying for regenerative medicine applications. So why are we interested in spatial context? So as you all know, cells communicate with each other to properly function in a human body. For instance, here, there's an example of multicellular system where A and, M cells, A and M cells, they send messages to neuron, neurons to fight with infections. And to study this complexity of these mechanisms, we need spatial data and molecular profiles of uh, these systems. And uh, however, um, yeah, oh, in addition to the loss of spatial context, so let me see, oh, to study these molecular differences, current technologies fall short. For instance, sequencing dissociates a large tissue sample for accurate ATCG sequencing, but in this process, we lose single cell details because it's ensemble level. But in, in addition to spatial details, the profiles can also map a small portion of the molecules inside the cells. Basically, it's not efficient. And it loses the spatial context as well as its low efficiency. Even the most recent single cell RNA, sequ RNA sequencing technologies, they suffer from um, the efficiencies of detection. For instance, if you have 100 RNA molecule in the tube, you may only, you may only get less than 10 molecule as a result of conversion. And our approach, however, is to use directly the images in the cells when they are sitting on a piece of microfluidic system. We are basically labeling the target molecules such as nucleic acids or proteins. Then we consistently label the same target with using multiple probes over and over again to create um, a high throughput profile of that cell using the microscope and the high, high performance computing. And we call this field image sequencing or in situ sequencing. And this field, spatial omics, shed light on cellular architecture. For instance, it can tell you about cell to cell variability in the DNA, RNA, or protein level, or it can also shed light on intracellular dynamics of chromatin structure, DNA, and transposon dynamics and long range interactions. Today, we'll be um, talking to you about more RNA dynamics or RNA um, spatial regulation in the single cell level for um, the various different applications. And for short, we now call this field as spatial transcriptomics in single cells. And there are two main stream approaches. One is, is those technologies based on next generation sequencing shown on the left. And the second one is the FISH-based technologies. FISH is a technique that is short for fluorescent in situ hybridization. So the idea is to be able to visualize these RNA molecules using single molecule images of RNA. And the right side are those technologies that images and then visualizes these RNA molecules 
and hence uh, enables image-based transcriptomics applications. And Dr. Rang Fan next week will talk to you about more the technologies on the left side, plus his new uh, microfluidic system that he is developing with that. But today I'll be focusing on those technologies on the right. And what are these spatial transcriptomics technologies that are based on fish uh, strategies? And there are recently two main technologies from Caltech and Harvard, one of which is, was called sequential fish, the other one is called, is called now merfish. There are two main technologies that are now providing a lot of answers to questions, but also there are other approaches called RCA or pet block based uh, sequencing. Some people also call this in situ sequencing based on Sweden. That has also generated very exciting data. And then Dr. Boyden's lab at MIT also, he has been com combining expansion microscopy with this multiplexing technologies. And also the company, ACD Bio, has been trying to achieve high multiplexing RNA scope technology. I'll be talking about what this technology is, but also it's for tissues and highly multiplex imaging. And finally, at Stanford, Dr. D0, in collaboration with uh, Gary Nolan, they developed this technology called StarMap for 3D transcriptional analysis in grain. So I'll be talking to you about these different technologies with a systematic story today. The first one that I, I will be um, presenting to you is the sequential fish because I have been involved in the development of this uh, from uh, the year of 2014 and all the way even now. And so these are the significant papers in this uh, technology. And this technology has to do with, again, looking at the RNA molecules in the cell, and you do not dissociate the cell. You basically look at the cell intact. Then we target RNA molecules using labeling technologies. Then we remove these labels and then relabel them with, again, the labels, but now using a different color, for instance, this mRNA1 previously it was green color, now it's in uh, blue color. After you re repeat this step multiple times, then it gets to the yellow color. So, which means that actually you can now target the same RNA with multiple colors as the RNA is positioned, is fixed and um, positioned inside the cell. As a result, you can create a color barcode here. It's basically this barcode, green, blue, all the way to yellow, green, blue, all the way to yellow. That gives you this barcode. So this is the main idea behind multiplexing experiments. And I'll be talking to you about more, more scaling up in the later slices, but this technology can potentially cover the entire genome, which can go all the way up to 15,000 or 20,000 genes. And so what do, we, what do we do exactly in these technologies? So we utilize this technology called single molecule fish. Basically you start with a cell and then you fix it permeabilize it with ethanol, then uh, this, sa this sample or um, cell is sta stationed on a little cover slip, a very thin cover slip that is compatible with high resolution imaging. Then we design targeting reagents to specifically label this, this one RNA type. And on this RNA type, we design DNA probes that are of 20 mer in length, 20 oligonucleotides and each of which is labeled with a dye molecule. It's basically fluorophore, and that enables us to get light from this RNA. But one or two would not be sufficient because there are too little signal for optical imaging. Therefore, we decorate as many as we can, all the way up to 24 and even more of these DNA pieces onto a single RNA. That makes this RNA detectable by the microscope. So for instance, this is the image of the same cell by a white field fluorescence microscope on which if you zoom into the same RNA, you would be looking at a single dot, single um, uh, spot. And this spot corresponds to the RNA molecule. And typically this is diffraction limited. Basic RNA would be a few nanometers, but the resolution of microscope could be 300 nanometers. Then this would be only 300 plus nanometers, which is a diffraction limited molecule, right? So we call this technology again fluorescent in situ hybridization for short. And then uh, this technology is now uh, widely used in, uh, in uh, different uh, biological applications. And uh, next slide. So this technology is great, but it is limited to 
only three or four color at a time, which means that by using a regular microscope, you can only look at blue, green, and red colors. But those colors would not be According sufficient. To Wikipedia, additive col those colors would not be sufficient to cover the entire genome of 20,000 genes. Therefore, we utilize these barcoding technologies that can assign multiple uh, circles with different colors to a single RNA molecule. For instance, this blue RNA molecule would be corresponding to a, an order of um, yellow, uh, red, and all these other four. And then, then you can change the combinations of these balls to, to assign to a unique RNA molecule. As a result, this technology is scalable by uh, F to the N, where F is number of colors, unique colors, and N is number, number of relabels. For instance, here, the N would be four, and F would be also uh, four. So it can uh, create four to the four different combinations. So here's the very early evidence of this technology and how it worked back in the 2013, 14 years that we used. And each single cell is a yeast cell. And then we targeted um, here at more than 10 genes. But again, we, once we took a picture of this with the microscope, we were only able to see four different um, genes here. So cyan, uh, cyan, magenta, yellow, and green colors. But these, again, four would not be sufficient to cover many genes. Therefore, what we did was relabel the same target with different colors in the second label, and in another set of different colors in the third label. Then as a result, it generated a color barcode sequence. RNA ones would be the, those that with the same colors, RNA two, RNA three, and RNA four. So then by using the number or appearances of these barcodes, these barcodes, for instance, this, could be used as gene expression of three. So in this area of a cell, there would be gene expression of three. Then we basically quantify gene expression per cell. So he, here you're looking at single cells. And then on the y-axis, you're looking at the number of barcodes that are repeating themselves in a, in a given cellular volume. And this is also a three-dimensional technology, I should note that we can absolutely quantify the RNA copy number with 95, more than 95% detection efficiency. So this is also great. We kind of initially developed this technology and methods worked, but there was one issue, which is that if you were to do these kind of multiplex ex experiments in very thick samples, for instance, whole mount chicken embryos or zebrafish or C. elegans, the, the signal would not be sufficient. Therefore, uh, we turned to technologies from uh, Niles Pierce lab at, at Caltech, who the, who are, who are the uh, research lab labs developing the, uh, the technology called hybridization chain reaction, in which they actually boosted the signal using a chemistry to look at gene expression in chicken embryos. Here, for instance, you're looking at three, four color areas of a chick embryo where there are differential changes of gene expression. So this technology is similar to fish. Basically, there's a target RNA and on which you design DNA pieces. But now we add another piece called initiators. And this initiator piece is then used to start a chain reaction, as you can see here, which utilizes a hairpin uh, set called H1 and H2. So both these are basic stable hairpins if you mix these guys and then add it to the cells, if there is no initiator, then they wouldn't necessarily stick because they are closed in closed phase. But if you label them with an initiator, then they will start chain reaction. And this is basically a thermodynamical design that they came up with and then which was uh, very helpful to combine with sequential fish technologies. So based on this technology, uh, and MD PhD student, um, Shield, he actually did this experiment where he combined the experiment with fish targeting using HCR. Then we utilized an enzyme again called DNAs to remove these chain part of the, uh, of the DNA and leaving the mRNA also unlabeled. Then we re relabeled the same RNA using a different color chain reaction. Then we removed it and then we again relabeled with a different color. As a result, you get the blue, uh, red dot for that RNA, 
and then green dot for the same RNA and then blue dot for the same RNA. But this dot will be much brighter in thick samples as a result of HCR amplification. And the barcoding scheme was also the same where we utilized multiple relabeling and then creating a color barcode sequence. And then these color barcodes then are assigned to individual genes. And here though, I should note that we, you know, our colleagues assigned in addition to barcode in a step called serial hybridization. It is because there are some genes that are really high copy. For instance, they are in the, uh, in the order of hundreds to thousands then we would be needing them to separate from barcoding because it will make it harder to barcode those genes. And therefore we separated them as individual barcodes that, uh, that, that are being mapped separately. Then this, this barcoded RNA maps and then the sequential serial RNA maps are combined to answer a biological question. And again, the system is very same, except that what you're looking at here is inside a very thick tissue, and you can easily localize individual RNA molecules as a result of hybridization chain reaction. And then the barcoding is also the same. Number 46 RNA would now correspond to different colors. As a result, we can find their identity on a piece of tissue. So using this technology, you know, SHIELD was able to uh, map out the unique spatial organization and spatial layering of cell classes in the dandate gyrus of a mouse brain. And then that was pretty unique. And then using clustering, he was able to show their spatial regulation. And not only this uh, brain uh, maps, then this technology allowed um, our spatial mapping of neural crest in chicken embryos as well as the intron, which is the part of RNA that's normally spliced out, but you can also label the RNA, that part of uh, RNA as well. If you label that part and then multiplex, then you can easily look at those immature RNA molecules inside the even nuclear region. And this was also another technology that was mapped out. And um, <clears throat> so next technology that I will talk about is yeah so oh the summary of this is that um, basically these technologies currently um, allowed us to look at 250 genes and then um, the applications were in neuroscience and stem cells and the colors were multicolor basically we used multicolor alignments and any confocal or wide field microscopes would work. But for tissues, confocal, uh, of course, is preserved, preferred. Then the microscope imaging should be done in 60x or 100x. And in this current setting, um, these experiments utilize DNA. DNA is one is a chemistry that can help you relabel the same target of RNA. And then it has also uh, tissue compatibility based on HCR chemistry. So the next technology that we are gonna talk about is MRFISH. And this technology has been also enabler in the field of spatial transcriptomics. And it has covered also similar years from 15 to 19. And in this technology, the idea is also very similar that we are targeting RNA molecules, RNA targets. But now instead of using one simple DNA sequence, now we are, you know, the technology is adding two different sequences onto the original sequence. So this is the original sequence that is unique to the RNA of interest. So for instance, this is RNA1, and this design, this DNA sequence is different than this DNA sequence than this DNA sequence. But now, if you have an extension of one and two redox sequences, then you can use the same purple DNA sequence everywhere here, or same blue, uh, once everywhere here. Then it allows you to cut the costs down significantly because then you can recycle the same imaging crop for the same cycle. Or even you can repeat them at the different cycle too. And then in addition to the use of um, DNAs or any other enzymes, th this technology first labeled this imaging probe to localize this RNA molecule. But then this probe after imaging was photo bleached. Basically, if you send very powerful laser light to the fluorophore, it would then fade away and then die. 
And therefore, you don't necessarily detect this in the second cycle or in the second hybridization label. Therefore, you can label a second um, imaging probe here that can help you get a different color. So here, instance, here for instance, you can get uh, magenta color. And on the second cycle, you can now get the uh, cyan color. And this way, you can continue hybridizing different colors onto the same RNA target. And then this is a technology that use, utilizes only one color, actually, the Sci-5 color, but it looks at, at different positions, time points. Therefore, it is a 0-1 barcode. It's basically binary that if you use N-cycle and hybridizations, it scales up by 2 to the N minus 1 barcodes. And minus 1 is the empty barcode. And here is this um, barcoding scheme and how it works. So you start with a cell again, you label it, then you add the, the long probes. And these long probes, I should note that, by the way, they are here, thirdimer, thirdimer, and thirdimer. So you basically design this specifically against your RNA, that when you look at the RNA molecules in the first cycle, you're looking at one type of RNA. Then you photo bleach it with laser light, then you label another set of RNA, and then you photo bleach, and then all the way up to 16 cycle. So using 16 cycles, since we are using only one color, but we are um, utilizing different part of RNA, then we can say that the combination is two to the 16 minus one, which can cover normally 60,000 RNA molecules. And here is the uh, smaller region from the experiment that can go all the way up to 16 hybridizations. And a small table that summarizes the barcoding scheme that they use. So those 16 hybridizations, they are denoted here. And then these are denoted individual spots, individual RNA molecules, right? So if you were to identify an RNA target, you could say, oh, I will just identify this by everything zero but one. But if but one, if this one has a problem in the detection, then you will lose this gene. Therefore, it necessi necessitates uh, a barcoding correction method. And this technology utilized this barcoding correction method called um, Hemming distance of four. Basically, if you have these two, two targets, and to make these two genes different, you will need to look at four different bits. If they are different from each other, like here, these are different, right? These are different, and these are different, and these are different. So there are four different bits that are different from each other. Then that is sufficient to call these two genes uh, as a different RNA target. And that basically helps to correct the errors during the experiments. And based on these experiments, then Murphish technology was able to help understand how RNA molecules are distributed in the cytosol. So before these experiments, most of the uh, RNA biology people, they have been suggesting the fact that RNA is more uh, randomly distributed. But the, in neuroscience, there were evidence that the dendrites, they have more RNA clusters for certain applications. But even normal cell lines also exhibited differences of RNA molecules. So these red color RNA versus the cyan color, they exhibited cytoplasmic spatial differences. So they, these are closer to edge, these are closer to nucleus. Then if you look at these two groups, the closer, those that are closer to nucleus, they're actually, um, yeah, they're actually these genes, but those closer to the edge, they are these genes. They are basically genes that are related to cell to cell adherence. So basically the function is occurring here, therefore the RNA is placed very close to that. So that's actually effect, you know, uh, suggesting a, an efficiency of the cell that you wanna keep your RNA next to your missionary. But that's not true for mo more of the RNA, but for maybe some for some of the RNA that has been uh, observed here. And another interesting point is that uh, out of these 1000 genes that Murphish uh, profiled, then some of these are co-regulated together. And this was picked up also in uh, in the spatial proximity of RNA altogether. And to capture, of course, 1,000 genes compared to 140 genes, then the error reduction reduced from four to two. So now only two differences should be sufficient to call these RNAs there as different RNA molecules. But this allows you to barcode more 1,000 
compared to the previous experiment, which was 140 RNA. So this, this is basically more erroneous, but still it allows you to look at 1000 G. And I should note that normally if you do an RNA fish experiment, you would, know, you would know that you work with a company called BioSearch or IDT, you design your genes and then they come to you and then you label them. But these are costly. Each experiment would be about $1,000, um, including both uh, of the genes or colors. Um, then if you add them up for a 100 gene experiment, that would be really costly. So to cut the cost down, uh, Murfish and a couple of other uh, research groups, they have worked out this protocol where it started with a microarray type oligo pool. So it's basically an oligonucleotide pool that has 100,000 sequences from which um, there is a protocol that has been very well worked out by a couple of research teams, but it basically utilizes the PCR in vitro uh, transcription and back to RNA conversion and then the lysis of the single cell DNA probe and leaving, leaving you with the final product of uh, RNA label. So this is basically the redot probe, the one with the imaging probe. This piece is the one with the sequence of the RNA target and specific one. And this one is the imaging probe too. So using the PCR handle or primer, it's been uh, produced on a piece of uh, well or any other tubing. Uh, it's been processed at the high throughput levels. So that can cut the cost of cost down. So you can get a oligo pool from Twist Biosciences and then design these in-house experiments and then get uh, many more genes out of this experiment. And this technology, Murfish, after all optimizations, automations, as well as the probe fabrication, uh, in 2018, it was able to help understand the structure of uh, spatial structure of cells in the pre-optic region of also brain. And this technology also utilized combinatorial barcoding and then a non-combinatorial sequential fish. This, this was called serial fish in the previous paper, but this is basically the high copy genes that you don't want to barcode. Then you would include cause stains of poly A or any antibody stains to find where the cells are then you do these experiments all automatically in a microfolding system. And here's the experiments, here's what you get. Here's what you get. And then um, after these experiments are recorded, then you can use your bioinformatic tools such as the heat maps with the normalizations or TSD maps for uh, reduction or any other correlation analysis. So this analysis of course allow them to map about 70 different neuronal pop populations with unique neuromodulatory function. Basically special transcriptomics, they're trying to discover new cell types with uh, a known or correlated function. And here's an example for instance in the brain. This slice can give you the very different cell types in the brain and they can be also classified by their function. And that is what was also shown in this experiment. And plus in this experiment, they utilize uh, normal single cell RNA seq to design and further shed light on the spatial regulation. And recently also um, to make Murfish compatible with deep tissues, uh, um, an amplification scheme was demonstrated where there is also this little RNA sequence imaging and a second imaging sequence. But now on top of the imaging sequence, they added many more uh, layers of, um, of uh, DNA pieces with the dye so that they got much brighter signal. And then they called it branched DNA. And then using the amplification, they were able to capture more RNA molecules in the image compared to those that are not amplified or unamplified. So this allows you again to look at the deep tissues. So the summary, Murfish was able to look at all the way up to 1,000 uh, genes and it worked in cultures and in most neuroscience. And it's a single color binary uh, barcoding, unlike Sickfish, Sickfish was color barcoding. And again, these microscopes would work and then high resolution is needed. Instead of DNAs, photo bleaching was utilized. And then currently, they're also testing a couple of different uh, sample clearing, which I, I didn't talk about but then all their Murfish uh, amplification chemistry is ready using the branch DNA. So in this part of the talk, I wanna gear to change the gear towards the optical density problem in spatial transcriptomics. 
So basically, if you label more and more genes, then you're gonna run out of space. Basically, if you have a parking lot, which is your cell, if you put more and more cars, after some time, you wouldn't be able to put more cars. So there's basically a density problem. And that's the same with the imaging too. So you image many more genes and you barcode them, but after some, after some time, you wouldn't be able to differentiate which one is which because it's very dense. Therefore, these sequential fish, murfish, and a couple of other technologies, they wanted to address this problem. And sequential fish, uh, I showed the slide before, but they had a most recent paper in 2019, which uh, allowed to uh, solve this optical crowding or optical density problem. And this technology allows, um, this optical, uh, uh, resolves the optical crowding problem, and then it enables transcriptome profiling. And how does it work? It is still a sequential labeling technology, but instead of using, let's say, five to 10 labels or sequential labels, you can spread these things all the way up to 20 labels, all the way up to 20. And then you basically dilute per cycle, you can dilute number of genes. Instead of, for instance, looking at 100 genes, you can look at only 20 genes. That reduces the density. Then in each image, then you can utilize this FIONA technology, the localization of individual uh, molecules. You can localize where it is and then save the positional data. Then once you save all these from each hybridizations, then you can create a super resolved image that has barcoding information. Again, from many more hybridization that optically dilutes the RNA concentration, but then using the localization of the images that uh, localizes and finds their position finally. Then using three color system, and in each color, similar to Murfish, you can then barcode these relabeling experiments, the 640, 561, and 488. And you do the barcoding within each color. That's also important difference in this technology, that the colorimetric aberrations would not affect your localization uh, accuracy. Because otherwise, these uh, sequential labels would not be able to easily um, kind of um, uh, aligned because of the colorimetric aberration issue, because one color may be shifted with the one more pixel, and that's hard to solve in optical imaging. Therefore, you do this barcoding within each color. And that should work nicely. And this technology allowed SIGFISH Plus, now this technology is called, to achieve up to 10,000 genes with high efficiency. And here you are looking at the genes at the edge of this uh, fibroblast cells. And uh, so then this technology allowed um, cell class and subcellular RNA localization classification in brain slices again. And here you are looking at original RNA positions. And here also, after UMAP classification, you can trace back these clusters to the images, and then you can find out subcellular localization of these RNA. They're, they're at the edge, they're at the center, or they're at only one edge, for instance. Um, and uh, then it can be also classified, these data sets can be classified using clustering algorithms and recoloring of the cells based on the clusters that they're coming from. And it can, it's actually more clear in this slide, for instance, you can cluster about 20 different cell types in the brain slices, but then those clusters you can go back and find on the original tissue slide and find out that this cell is, belongs to the cluster one, this cell belongs to the cluster three. And then furthermore, if you know some of the genes, for instance, these two genes, they're one corresponds to uh, and the telial cell more, and this one is corresponding more microglia cell, then you can tease out the cellular interactions on the images based on the receptor ligand interactions directly. So microglia would be interfering, interacting with endothelial cells, and you would find out these things from RNA pictures. Classically in immunology, this has been studied in, um, in uh, tissue sections using just immunofluorescence, but here there's a paradigm shift that you can use the RNA signatures. These are the six fish, six fish plus profiled all the way up to 10,000 genes. It's getting very close to transcriptome level. And then the applications are cell cultures and neuroscience and single color binary within each channel to avoid colorimetric shifts and a confocal wide field microscopes. And 60X microscope and localization has been used. Again, and another novelty here is that localization improved the spatial details of RNA barcoding to sub 100 nanometer. 
So that's actually a very high resolution already. And then instead of, uh, I didn't talk about this, but instead of DNAs chemistry, the sequential relabeling re utilized another uh, chemistry known as formamide. So this changes the basically melting temperature of the oligos. As a result, you can adjust the oligo con the concentration of formamide to anneal or strip the, um, the RNA DNA hybrids. And this was used in this technology. And then tissue potential is still maybe, and it can be applied. And here also, I should note that they utilized another background uh, clearing method. Therefore, there's no need uh, for signal uh, boosting because the background is already low. So to address the optical density problem, a second solution would be to uh, utilize expansion microscopy. So for instance, if you have a cell this big, if you make the cell 10, 10 times more bigger, then per same area, you get less number of RNA molecules, right? So basically, if you get a balloon, and if you basically blow the balloon, then on the balloon, the size of a circle, and after expansion will be much less dense. So you will see much less uh, optical color in the after expansion. Therefore, expansion was combined with uh, Murphy's technology in the most recent 2019 paper. And these are the images after expansion microscopy. And again, individual molecules of RNA can be detected. And a specific chemistry was developed for this after fixation of cells. The, it went through multiple processes where uh, the cell was um, expanded multiple times. So this is the cell size. And after expansion, it looks like this. Then in this specific paper, in addition to looking at RNA, they also targeted proteins for endoplasmic reticulum. And as a result, they were able to find out the barcodes for RNA that can be overlaid by the protein pictures of endoplasmic reticulum and nucleus. And again, using this uh, multi-omics approach where they combine protein and RNA, they were able to find out the RNA molecules that are enriched on endoplasmic reticulum. So here are the cell pictures. And all the way down to these original images, this, the gray color shows more ER. And then the red ones are the RNA molecules that are very close to ER in the reticulum. So as a result, you can actually find out those genes that are very functionally related to end up as reticulum. Or you can find out the genes that are also related to nuclear regions, right? That's the similar idea. And then another novelty that this, that this paper also explored is the dynamics of RNA which they call RNA uh, velocity. So based on basic transcription and export and degradation levels, how does the RNA dynamics work? To study this, basically they related the cells to their cell cycle dependent RNA regulation modes. So they were able to find out more than 1,000 genes that are specifically correlated with the cell cycle uh, differences. And this paper also utilized nicely the RNA velocity concept. So again, the Murfish plus expansion summary here, and it was able to provide up to 10,000 genes in cell cultures and neuroscience. It used single color binary and similar microscopes was used. And again, the multiplexing was uh, done by photobleaching. Expansion clears background, that's just a nice thing. But a disadvantage of expansion is that since you are making the same thing three times or 10 times as, as bigger, then you reduce the signal per pixel and that reduces the uh, signal, and that's a disadvantage in this case, but still it worked fine in their hands. And I will quickly go over these parts, but if you were to utilize another computational technologies that can uh, solve this density problem, for instance, if you label green and uh, red for ribosomal proteins, these are RNA pictures for ribosomal proteins, then they create all these yellow colors. These are showing that the uh, yellow and red, they're overlapping all over the place. So you cannot easily do barcoding. And to solve this problem, you can actually just multiply the cellular images from label one, label two, just multiply, and then you can get the number of molecules that are at the similar positions. So this technology was also called correlation fish. It's a computational technology that can quantify gene expression per cell, even if in the high density of RNA labeling. So here are some pictures from these experiments and also another ex you know, experiment in the uh, thymus tissue samples for immunology applications. And as we just showed, 
expansion fish also can be used just like the Murphy's technology, but Ed Boyd and Steam also combined labeling of uh, housekeeping genes on non-coding RNA genes. And here is one image before expansion and after expansion. And these are the images of long non-coding RNA that can be really much nicely resolved after, uh, after expansion. And they were also, also able to combine sequential fish with expansion in this paper, and that's a similar idea. And finally, in the brain slices, the YFP images for proteins very well correspond to, to expansion fish that was combined with the HCR. So basically these images and these images, they all agree well with each other. So especially if you zoom into these here, you can easily see the nice labels for uh, HCR expansion fish. So these are the RNA labels in uh, brain slices. And that basically very well worked in their case. So correlation fish and expansion fish, they were able to profile, uh, profile up, up to dozen, dozen genes, let's say 10, 10 plus genes. And um, cell cultures and thin slices worked fine. And you also perform a single color binary barcoding. And then uh, this technology utilized either DNA is one or another cleavage chemistry. And then it was able to also show uh, imaging uh, experiments in the tissues or brain slices. So um, a relatively actually even older technology, but that can be used for in-situ sequencing is uh, RCA, or there's a typo here, it should be rolling circle amp uh, amplification and padlock probes. And this is mostly the, based on the work of this team at the Sci Life Labs in Sweden. And these are the most recent papers. And in this technology, you still use imaging, but before these colors are added to the RNA labels, you perform multiple steps. You start with the RNA, and then you get to a ball of target DNA. As a result, you perform sequencing by ligation. Basically, you add one nucleotide at, uh, at a time. You add colors onto the same target. But this process, which I'm not going to go into the uh, details, is less efficient because of the cDNA enzyme that reduces the detection efficiency of mRNA to um, you know, very low, to 10 to 20 percent detection. Therefore, this technology, while it's older, still it has lower efficiency uh, in the field. And regardless of efficiency problems, they were able to nicely look at the uh, RNA molecules in breast cancer tissues here. And they, they were able to even look at the 31 uh, genes in uh, very much uh, in a typically or pathologically interesting regions, cancer versus the other regions. And more recently, even in 2020, they combined sequence, uh, RNA sequencing with ISS, the institute sequencing, to look at brain slices again for about 99 genes. Where were they able to Yeah, whoever just joined in, please mute yourself. Yeah. So they were able to look at up to 99 genes in the brain slices. And by now, you should have noticed that in the spatial transcriptomics, brain is one of the favorite slices to look at. I think it's also partially because of a lot of unknowns in brain, and it's also the robustness of mass models from brain research, but it can be extended to other models, just like we learned last week for uh, heart biology, you can study different organs. So um, ISS summary. So it covered all the way up to 99 genes. It worked in cultures, cancer, or brain. And then it worked with multicolor per base. And, and here, unlike single molecule technology, that you can even use 20x or 40x because the idea is not, used, is not to use single molecule localization, but it is just to look at the differences on the tissues. Therefore, you can even use a lower uh, microscope objective because the R RCA and PEDLOG designs, they're very bright compared to others. Even if there is sensitivity issues or specificity issues, I would say, still it's very bright that can be detected by 20x or 40x imaging applications. So <clears throat> I think one of the final technologies is StarMap for 3D RNA imaging. So this technology again aims to look at the brain slices. And similar to RCA, they utilize something called snail crub, which was developed in Gary Nolan lab but then that was uh, transferred to Carl Lizer lab to look at RNA. And then the readout is sequencing by ligation. It's still the same thing. But as a result of all this chemistry, they were able to map, map the nice ordering of cell types in brain slices. So this is the original image. These are the digitally 
identified cell types. As you can see, the layering is nicely reconstructed. So the technology is again this padlock. So it's basically the circle thing plus this additional thing. They, when they come together on the correct RNA, they give the signal. But if this primer and then the padlock there, if they're on different RNA, they wouldn't give the signal. So basically, it's very specific compared to uh, the RCA approach. And there's no other enzyme conversion. And after these are placed on to the RNA, then you can create still a nice signal from uh, sequence by ligation and then on each cycle then you can do also color checking for this rna you can change the you can see that it changes the color based on nucleotide the next nucleotide gets added so as the next nucleotides the new nucleotides that are added the color changes and as a result of which you can actually find out the rna type from this experiment and uh, so here's the very complex map i'm not going to get into all details but what it says is that it utilizes these uh, probes to amplify the signal, right? And then it utilizes also sequencing by ligation to get the ATCGs. But in between, it also incorporates hydrogel chemistry to reduce the background of tissues in the brain slices, right? But I'm not going to get into the de uh, details of this chemistry for now. But uh, finally, as a result of all these nice uh, novelties, they were able to achieve about 160 genes and 112 cell type markers and 48 activity regulated genes nicely in different layers of this mouse brain. And they were able to classify by function as well. Again, for spatial transcriptomics, number of cell types and their corresponding function is the key. And here's a very interesting data about 1,000 genes in the uh, V1 region of the brain, that was nicely dec decorated. And then in the Z-score heat map, it showed also unique separation of functional differences that correspond to the cell types. And this is kind of a summary slide. I didn't, I didn't talk about the physique. Next week, Dr. Fan may, may possibly talk about this, but uh, this physique, PEDLAC or RCA technology, they utilize this uh, um, reverse transcription process, which decreases the efficiency of detection for the RNA molecules. So here you can see the efficiency of detection actually 0.2%, 0.01%. But the SNAIL and previously another technology called PLAYER, they were able to detect with much more higher detection efficiency of about, you know, at least up to all the way up to 40%. So startup summary, they were able to look at up all the way up to 1,000 genes. And then it worked in cell cultures and brain slices. It's multicolor. And like us, confocal was used because it's a tissue sample. And even the 40X actually worked in their case because it wasn't, again, a single molecule necessarily interest that they had. And then the multiplexing was by sequencing by ligation. As the new nucleotides are added, it gave basically more unique colors per that RNA spot. And then it worked uh, in the tissues nicely because hydrogel chemistry removed the background. And then SNAIL amplification improved the signal. And I'll also move this quickly, but another company has this essay called uh, RNA Scop. Am I on time? Oh, yeah, I'll be quick. So basically, this essay is targeting the RNA using a ZZ probe here that's specific uh, for the RNA targets. But by again using the multiple labeling approaches, sequential approaches, they were able to create 12 flex maps. And here are the 12 flex maps in the brain slices. And basically, these are the technologies that allow you to get about 24 uh, genes using RNA scope amplification using these ZZ structures. And special notes, uh, if you're interested in learning more, these are the papers that I would recommend reading from Peter Sims, Columbia, from Birdie, Cambridge, from uh, G.H. Uh, he's He has his lab at Cold Spring Harbor and physics expert. And then from Moore's lab, and these extra two people, they devised also a very nice technology that showed the layering in spatial biology, but their technology is different. And Philip Keller from Genelia, as well as Matt Nielsen from Sweden. I'd suggest you read this paper carefully. And to summarize, um, spatial transcriptomics can achieve all the way up to 10,000 genes. And it, mostly it's used for targeted profiling in biology single or multicolors can be used and you will need a microscope to perform the experiment to perform the experiments but you don't necessarily need 60x even the 20x or 40x may work if you have enough signal 
It's basically a quantitative map. If you use lower magnification, single molecule, if you use higher magnification. For multiplexing, you can use photo bleach, clearing of dyes, chemical bleach, uh, and then DNA is one chemistry, high uh, concentration format, as well as the sequencing and other technologies. And tissue for tissues to work, you need clearing, thin uh, slices or amplification technologies. And for signal bo boosting, you can use branched DNA, RNA scope, SNAIL, RC, or HCR. And then the cost, if you're just gonna do 10 genes using IDT, it would cost you about 10K. But if you're gonna go all the way up to 150 or 10,000 genes, then the cost may go higher, even if you use the uh, oligopool technology. And I would suggest the vendors buy a, um, well, it's not of course a conflict of interest, but uh, as a friend, I say that I'm use, sometimes using these vendors for my research, bio search, IDT, Tivist bio, Curtilling bio. And then this presentation along with the PDF references can be found in this link. And thank you guys. Yeah, thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, so questions? So we have one question from the chat. Uh, maybe Ahmed, you can go ahead and read. Uh, let me find out the chat. Just a second. How do I go back to chat here? Could you read it? Actually, I can kind of track here. Uh, yeah, I can do. Uh, so the question is from uh, Erdogan. Um, Mameli, uh, the question is about, can you talk about some of the additional key limitations of these technologies and uh, emerging methods to overcome them? Uh, for example, what are the copy number and the size limitations of the target RNAs and how about detecting yes. RNA targets with uh, high uh, sequence similarities? Okay, exactly. So great question. Uh, I think the length of the RNA should be at least one, uh, one thousand base and higher, longer, because you want to decorate as many as you can, right? So therefore, uh, a few hundred bases for microRNA may have a hard time in this technology. Therefore, if you look at all these technologies, it works for either long non-coding RNA or mature RNAs or intron, right? And introns are shorter, but their numbers might be higher. That's why it can get an easy signal. Um, and the limitations of these technologies uh, are that you need a specialized uh, microscope for this and custom written algorithms. So it's more technically challenging. I think that's a limitation. Um, and copy number, uh, copy number, you can even detect a few copy per cell. I did it for like GEDA3 in the T cells and it worked fine. It was really nice. And it can go all the way up to 1,000 copies and even more in the case of ribosomal proteins. I don't think there's a limitation. I think the limitation might be the alignment of barcodes with different dynamic range of copy numbers. I think that would be limitation. Yeah. And then I think Peter has a question, right? The mm -hmm. cost listed is total cost for many genes. What is the total time that these techniques take? Okay. Uh, the cost, I think it's just random. I kind of thinking what would take for the kits that you use for PCRs and all these and oligopole, I just put a random cost. I think it would be relatively total, but it might be even higher if you want to repeat this multiple times, of course. And it's not just one time that it will work and it will be a couple of processes. So that actually is a cost, right? If you want to do it higher and higher. What is the total time that these techniques takes to the image section of comparable size? So these are all automated. Uh, you can look at even a million cell in a day or two using a microscope uh, that's automatically scanning and imaging and everything, and then automatically also stitched all together. So that's why as long as the microscope, for instance, sits in your lab or in a core facility that you book for a couple of days, you should be able to get the data. Uh, that's more also accurate. Yes, but that imaging time is the limitation. That's why we are aware of that technology. So. Uh, in my past, I worked on some technologies that can look at a very large area using lensless imaging. So that can be a future direction for this if they have enough sensitivity for these kind of technologies. Joe Genera has a question. What do you see as the most usable complementary methods to identify regions of interest to investigate with, with these methods? Course, the resolution of RNA or protein methods. What do you see as the most usable complementary methods? I mean, if you put, of course, RNA and protein together, 
the protein will give you more functional significance of those corresponding RNA molecules. But remember that the assays in the protein labeling will be detrimental for RNA because they break the RNA. That's why you need to use the labeling RNA first, then the protein. And, but if you create these uh, labeling, that would be fantastic, of course. So what you can do is you can label the RNA first, then you can do either proteomics or metabolomics, and then try to align them on top of each other because everything is relative and they should work fine. What are the typically used microfluidic systems like? So these are all custom built systems that you can actually use like a little cover slip with a little uh, plastic chamber on top and then put two tubings, right? That's one easy way to do it. Or you can create a large uh, bioreactor type of chamber where you have needles that's going in and then they basically move things in and out. But uh, the important thing is the uh, labeling hybridization buffers. They are very viscous. So therefore, if you do the hybridization first, then if you put the imaging uh, probes in the automated microfluidics, then actually you will be better off. So actually you will need to, need to still do a manual step at the beginning for high viscous buffers, but then continue with the auto, automated microfluidics uh, as, as, as it is multiple days. And then Kyla has a question, what is the advantage and disadvantage of comparing with 10X spatial uh, transcriptomics? I think 10X spatial transcriptomics, Dr. Rong Fan will talk about that next week, I'm hoping. But that technology typically is lower resolution. Currently, it's, the reported resolution is about 55 micrometer. While it can cover a large uh, number of genes, uh, the resolution might be a limitation, right? And therefore, I think it's complementary still to next spatial, and it might be cost effective as well. But if you're interested in subcellular mechanism and stuff like that, it may not be the perfect, perfect approach. And Tiangye Yang has a question. Could you please talk about how these techniques can be applied to live imaging or the main challenges for such replication? Yes. These uh, technologies, they require, um, they require fixed samples. But recently, uh, Dr. Michael Elowitz used actually an enzyme that continued some of these transcriptions after you land on the RNA DNA complexes. It was able to continue the transcription. He called it zombie. You may want to take a look at that application. So that actually still con continues to do analysis even if the sample is dead. But of course, if you're talking about live, exactly live, live, like GFP and all these things and tracking. So one suggestion would be that you can do the live tracking first, then fix it, and then continue with the spatial transcriptomics. Then the last time point will be the one that we can, you can do the correlations of live and uh, spatial transcriptomics. Could you please talk more about how these techniques can be applied to live image? Yeah, that's actually what we just talked about, yeah. Main challenges, yeah, the, basically it's just last, uh, data point that you can uh, correlate. But of course, if one can develop a barcoding technology for live, that could be also interesting. Uh, but I guess that's more like um, Roger Tissian's uh, uh, domain, I would say, not in this domain, but that could be interesting to live cell barcoding. What's the main advantage of sequencing each base given they can actually sequence the entire gene or fish type of experiments? Um, given that they can actually sequence the entire gene, what's the measure of sequencing each base? So each base can at least get you the potential of the mutation differences, but fish cannot easily detect the mutation unless you design a specific chemistry for it. Uh, therefore, if you want to look at, for instance, mutation mode along with the gene expression, I think the each base information could be more helpful there, uh, or SNP differences, right? Those could be interesting to look at as well. But if you're looking at just cell types and their their uh, classifications, I think uh, you may not not even need the each base information. But for more mutations, it's related. Uh, so, for the interest of time, we will not take more questions. But I think mm -hmm. one of the questions uh, that that we skipped are probably rele uh, relevant. I think one of the questions was uh, whether or not uh, you know any kind of consortium uh, they archive on a image data and uh, people can pull on the data and uh, do their own spatial omics analysis? So um, I'm aware of the developments in the Human Cell Atlas Initiative. Uh, in there, they tried to kind of create this consortium and share the data. And the goal was to also deliver it to the public. And then they also collaborate with these open source um, data uh, bases. I can try to find out and uh, send you to those who are interested in processing those. 
Uh, I think it's most of the Human Cell Atlas uh, Consortium, they're trying to put this together. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, thank you all and uh, thank you, uh, Professor Koska, for this wonderful overview of this imaging-based uh, spatial technology, this whole field. Uh, I'm also, uh, I think this is such a wonderful turnout and I totally, uh, I think I did anticipate we have more than 100 people uh, interested in this today and uh, given that it's a good Friday and I cannot expect it, uh, there's a lot uh, lower uh, people uh, trying to join in, uh, but unfortunately, I think we uh, the Zoom uh, the Zoom has uh, the sort of the limit, which is 100 people. Uh, I will try to resolve that problem next week. Uh, if you are uh, interested in this seminar series, uh, please dial in. Uh, uh, dial back in next week and Friday at 3 p.m. And uh, also, you can try to follow us on Twitter, and we can post. Uh, sort of the, the link if Professor Coach Kang uh, agreed to share the recorded video today and uh, I will uh, share the link how to download everything uh, at our uh, Twitter account. So thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Ryan. Yeah, thank you all. Mm -hmm. Take care and uh, have a good holiday. Sure.